Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for the short introduction, Klaus. Um, I would like to give this talk on some uh, theoretical uh, issues on microlearning. Uh, because I think uh, in our master course we will uh, make a bridge for uh, coming from uh, theoretical side to the practitioners and back from the practitioners to the theoretical side. So what I'm concerned in this talk are four topics. At first uh, I would like uh, to give you a short introduction what exactly is understood uh, with the term or buzzword of microlearning. And then I will go more into three theoretical issues. Normally people don't uh, exactly um, combine it with microlearning, but I will give you some motivation that time, the learning activity, and some kind of validity claims are very important, not only in microlearning, but in every kind of uh, interactive learning. So let's start about the introduction. What exactly is microlearning? Um, I give you here um, some kind of uh, a quote. Um, well, it's a come, uh, certain new word, new buzz, buzzword um, in the learning and development is industry. Uh, it's something to do with uh, short uh, pieces of uh, text. Uh, maybe I'll give you another uh, explanation in the next uh, slide. Um, but here, let, let me uh, summarize here. Um, it's important that people are thinking that's a new way of learning. I'm not so sure about this. I think it's a new perspective on learning, but not a, a right way or not a new way. It's just another, uh, maybe for me, a good like aspect of learning. So let's go to the next slide and give you some examples of microlearning. Uh, reading a short paragraph of text, uh, of course, is a kind of microlearning. Uh, many people are uh, combining with microlearning using flashcards with the computer or with the mobile device. Yeah? Um, memorizing words, vocabulary, uh, for instance, or uh, some kind of selecting an answer to a questions and answering questions in quizzes, for instance. The important thing uh, of all these kinds of activities is uh, that we have small chunks of information, so-called knowledge nuggets. And here there is one very important theoretical question. Does this mean that micro-learning is just on simple issues, as most people believe? I will give you another perspective. I think we can also use it for quite interesting and quite complex issues. The second uh, aspect is time. Micro-learning or the other side, micro-teaching is uh, sometimes uh, defined as a short learning time, uh, seconds up to 15 minutes uh, in this uh, time frame, time range. But here, important, a very, here is important uh, the definition of learning time. Learning time is the time students use for learning. It's not the same as the um, uh, physical time frame. Uh, I could spread 15 minutes into uh, several hours because I could learn every uh, hour two, three minutes. So please uh, do not mix learning time with physical time. Learning time is the time the uh, student or the learner is really involved in learning tasks. Uh, so that's important. And you see here already that we have a different kind of uh, uh, setting. Um, it could be uh, over a long range of time that we have uh, very small, short pieces of time during this time frame. The next one. So, and here now my question arises, it's not only for simple task, because you could divide a very complex task into uh, simple task, but the task itself, the learning uh, challenge, could be quite complex. The next issue is learning activity. And here, uh, we normally, the idea by uh, microlearning is normally it is uh, triggered by uh, push technology. 
the idea is to minimize the cognitive load so the user of the mobile devices get some reminder, for instance. And from the pedagogical point of view, that raises a big question. Does that mean, does this mean that uh, microlearning is uh, concentrated or directed on uh, to externally controlled learning? So then we would have a problem. Then we would have the problem that we, uh, it's just uh, a learning uh, controlled by the outside, by a teacher, and we do not have the possibility uh, to support self-determined learning. But you will see that I'm uh, eager and uh, I'm very concentrated and very concerned with the autonomous learner. So the question is, could we use micro-learning also for the autonomous learner? And the last question is uh, about uh, the different kinds of uh, validity claims. Uh, if you don't know what a validity claim is, I will explain it a little on. Uh, the question is, it's not only uh, the facts they are mattered, but it's also kind of other personal issues, uh, subjective issues, emotional issues, social issues. Okay, so now let me start with the theoretical framework. Yeah? Um, I think uh, theory is important, uh, quite, uh, it's quite important uh, from uh, the uh, practical perspective. Uh, I have used this um, quote from uh, Kurt Levine. I think it's a very important quote. So let me talk about more now about theory and don't be afraid. I will come back to practical issues as well in the end of the talk. So uh, what I would like to stress is some kind of a fundamental theorem uh, I worked out in my, one of my last books, uh, Taxonomy of Teaching Methods. Uh, the quote is very complicated, but actually the whole talk is, about, uh, is around uh, this quote. So I will explain every word in this quote uh, piece by piece. So the quote states, educational action is the mapping of semantic relations into the time necessary for acquisition of knowledge and competences under the perspective of validity claims. Okay, that's complicated, I know. So let's go and start with the aspect of time. Uh, you see here in the quote, it's mentioned time. So what does it mean, time, uh, under the meta uh, frame of uh, learning or, the, or education? Here you see some kind of a hierarchical issue. It's not only a hierarchical, but it means it's a so-called so inclusive hierarchical. Uh, I've not used the pyramid, but I have used circles inside circles, meaning that the micro-level educational interaction is included in a higher level, let's say, in the programmer curriculum. So that means that a program curriculum can't exist without educational interaction, educational scenarios, educational ensembles, module, etc. So you can see uh, we are going from the very small, from seconds to minutes, uh, to the very big one, to national and international educational politics. And as you can assume, uh, I think that's not a surprise, Microlearning is more on the lower level. But important enough, it's very important to see the connection to the higher levels. So microlearning is not isolated. It's not an isolated issue. It's not just learning words. I think that's the old tradition, old-fashioned traditions. If you are learning vocabulary, for instance, then we'll learn it for the use, uh, to use in the in an interview or to use it uh, in a conversation to use it on, on the large scales. So the important thing is that microlearning is embedded in larger frames as well. And this embeddedness means that there is some kind of interaction. I don't want to go too into the philosophical details of this interaction, but we call some kind of interactions emergence. Emergence means that the higher level is, consists of pieces of the lower level but 
they needed to build some kind of structure and the structure itself is not inside the parts themselves. So the higher level is always more than the summary of the, uh, all the pieces in the lower level. But I don't want to go too much into detail in the philosophical issues, but it is important to observe that we have the relationship between higher levels and lower levels. Uh, if you're thinking now about the levels of actions, or, or you can also call it the levels of educations, or the action radius for education, uh, and then we have some kind of levels of descriptions or degree of abstractions. Um, I have here uh, that one of the results of my book on taxonomy of teaching methods. We have seen uh, from A to H, uh, these are the levels I have, uh, uh, I have shown you in the uh, slides before. Uh, this inclusive hierarchy. Here you can't see the inclusion, but here can you see the different kind of hierarchies. And from the, uh, that's, so the, 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 the one axis. The other axis, from description to categories, are abstractions, uh, educational abstractions. Categories are very, very abstract, and normally you can't design educational scenarios with these kind of abstract issues. Uh, but description itself, the very concrete descriptions, they are too concrete to form educational models or educational patterns. So we need some kind of intermediate step, some kind of a compromise. <clears throat> Important enough, uh, the uh, area of educational design we have between the A to the E level. Uh, and we have it in the patterns and models uh, area, meaning that here is the, uh, the dominant area of educational methods. Uh, the other levels, they are important, but they are more on the meta level. They are more for uh, uh, directors of uh, educational schools or other educational institutions or politicians. But microlearning, as I told you, is on the interaction level, is on the very small level. But as you have seen, it's embedded in the other levels, so there has to be some kind of connections. And if you are designing microlearning, you have also designed larger uh, learning objectives. So let me summarize the aspect of time. We have different levels uh, of educational designs with different laws, by the way, with different uh, perspective and different, uh, different aspects. Uh, and uh, therefore, we have to choose uh, an adequate level of uh, organization, uh, or let's say of an uh, um, uh, appropriate level of educational design. So you can't, uh, let's say, design a module without interaction in the, the micro level learning, micro learning level. But what is important enough, you can't build up a module just by uh, aggregating all the smaller levels on the, uh, 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 on, the, on the bottom side. So what we need is that the micro learning implementation processes require a top down and a bottom up strategy. That's very important. And most of the people, they only have these uh, bottom-up strategies, but that's not enough because you have to come and you have to build up uh, larger educational goals or targets, and then also to think how you combine bottom-up strategies with top-up, uh, top-down strategies. So let me come to the next point. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit uh, old. I need some glass of water. Uh, we are coming back to the very complicated quote. And here now I will show the, you the next aspect. Uh, it's the aspect of knowledge and competences. I call it the acquisition of knowledge and competences. Uh, what is meant here? Uh, we have different kind of competences. Um, and I call this kind of competences transfer tutor and coach. 
I'm not sure what happened here. Sometimes, uh -huh. sometimes the slides uh, are not fully uh, visible. Um, the important thing is that on the transform mode, I call it learning one, we are concentrated on uh, very uh, issues um, concerned with facts. Uh, transfer of knowledge to know and to remember. So it's more the low scale of educational issues. Uh, this is the kind of domain of simple task. And as you can see in the picture uh, by the teacher here, it, uh, that's the reason why uh, is, is the, I, I don't have to uh, show something with the mouse. It destroys, the, there's something wrong with it. Uh, on the transfer mode, you can see uh, uh, that it's more or less uh, a teaching mode. It, for instance, I'm in the transfer mode at the moment. I teach and I explain, and there is no much interaction with you. Um, there is no presentation of predetermined pro problems, there is no practice, and so on. And uh, there is, uh, on the third level, on the very high level, we have learning mode three, and this is the, some, some kind of a constructivist approach. I uh, call it coach. Uh, that's the realization of adequate action strategies in real world situations. And here you see that the uh, responsibility of the teacher goes down. In the transfer mode, it's very dominant. In the tutor mode, uh, they work together. And in the coach mode, uh, the, uh, the teacher observes and helps in the tutor mode. And in the coach mode, they are uh, on peers. They are on the same level. They work together to solve problems. So what does... Uh, th this means that we have different kinds of uh, cognitive uh, processes and different kinds uh, of abstraction of knowledge. Uh, the facts are the very small one pieces, sometimes also called uh, so-called knowledge nuggets. But I'm much more interested on the higher levels. I'm much more interested uh, about concept procedures at metacognitive level. Um, and the metacognitive level is not only important to remember, but also to understand, to apply. And you can see also to create yourself uh, metacognitive strategies uh, that's important for the self-autonomous learner. So from the left side to the right side, you see uh, on the left side the learner who is guided and directed, even controlled by the teacher, and on the right side you will see the uh, autonomous learner. Uh, and now the question is how to come from uh, the uh, guided and controlled uh, learner to the autonomous learner. And normally, this is not a task in microlearning, but in my point of view, in my perspective, it's also very, very important. So you don't have to uh, stop with microlearning, uh, giving some facts to the people. It's important to get some uh, ideas how to liberate the learner, how to uh, remove control from the learner so that the learner is coming from a kind of a push technology to the pull technology, he asks or she asks for uh, learning objects uh, for uh, more information and is interested and motivated to learn more, to understand more, to apply the knowledge, uh, but you can support this, but it's important that you, uh, we call that faded, that you come, that the teacher uh, draws back his uh, guidance and, uh, and helps the learner uh, to learn him or herself uh, the issues uh, concerned with. And you see here the three modes I've talked about before. We have now called it teaching or learning one, teaching two and teaching three. And the interesting thing uh, is normally uh, teaching or learning three is on the middle or macro level. And I'm interested now uh, also to investigate, could we use teaching three also for microlearning? So that's a question and I think we could, because uh, we could uh, offer very complex situation 
and to help students uh, to uh, cope with these problems. Yeah? But it's important to design problems uh, so that we can um, sli take slices apart and present uh, in a very small time frame. Even if the time frame is a long in the physical time, uh, we will give the uh, learner small pieces, small activities uh, to cope with the big problem. So let's summarize the second aspect. We have a systematic interrelation between the didactic modeling of microlearning and the targeted level of the learning process. Uh, I have shown you a, a cognitive taxonomy by Anderson and Crutford, but we could also take uh, a skill taxonomy or emotional taxonomy. Uh, but we're mostly in the university level, we are uh, we, we, we used and uh, we have learned uh, how to use the cognitive uh, taxonomy. But it's also important, almost what I have said, you could also use for uh, emotional uh, and um, uh, the body level, let's say the skill and, and, and the physical level, uh, and also for the social level. And the second point of view I would like to stress is that higher learning goals also require higher quality and higher intensity of uh, microlearning. I, I have used here the word virtual mobile coaching process. So the idea is that you could use uh, the mobile learning uh, as a kind of a virtual coaching process uh, where uh, the learner or the user of uh, the microlearning system uh, is guided, is coached uh, by the system, um, yeah, directed by the system, uh, the system offers some help and so on. Now I come uh, to the third aspect, to the third and last aspect. I will now talk about uh, validity claims. What are validity claims? Okay, uh, the, the, the name validity claims uh, comes from Jürgen Habermas and his theory of communicative action. And the idea is that uh, with every sentence, but also that's the idea by Habermas, a sentence is kind of speech act. So a sentence itself is a kind of an action. If I say, but it, this is now in quotes, don't let, take it literally. Yeah? If I would say, now the webinar is closed, then it's a kind of actions uh, because it's announcing that this is closed and uh, immediately follow that people drop out from the seminar and so on. Uh, these two people now are married. Yeah? It's just a speech act, but with the speech act, uh, I take an action, and the action has a lot of consequences, by the way, yeah? when you are married, for instance. So, uh, validity claims are challenges uh, to the world, but they have three aspects. That's the important thing. Normally, we have only the, we only think on the objective uh, consequence, on the objective validity claims. We call it normally truths. Uh, if I say now the room, uh, the door is closed in my room, uh, you can't see it now my door, but everybody in my room uh, can see it uh, and can say, okay, it is right or it is wrong. Uh, if you have some hypothesis, you could try to uh, go through the open door, but if you hit the door, then you get uh, some feedback from the real world. So it wasn't true because the door isn't uh, closed. Uh, open door closed, yeah? whatever I have said. Uh, so the objective point of view is kind of a truth value and my validity claim is that what I'm seeing has an objective reference to the world. But I could also say it on a subjective way. For instance, if I would say um, my, uh, one of my employees is in the room, uh, Christian Fertel, the administrator is helping me with this talk, and if I would say to him, please uh, bring me a glass of beer, then he could challenge it on the objective way. In our kitchen, there is no beer. He could also say it on the subject, on the social way, let's say the next one, that it's not usually uh, the case that you can't uh, drink beer during a webinar. It's not norm, it's not the norm. Yeah? Uh, so it's not, it's some kind of forbidden in the university to take a glass of beer during the webinar. 
but he could also challenge it on the subjective way. He could say, sorry, Peter, but I'm not your butler. Yeah? I'm the admin here, I'm a technical person, and I'm not bringing you beer from the kitchen now. Yeah? So what I wanted to say is that if every sentence, every actions I'm doing always have these three kinds of uh, orientation to the world, always hide three kinds of validity claims. This is important now for the learning process as well, even if it's a large learning process on a higher level or on the micro learning level. Because we have educational settings and we have the subject, the theme, the material, this covers the objective levels. We are used to, as a teacher, we are used on subject, theme and materials. But we have also to learn about the co-learner the, the social side of learning. Yeah? By the way, the co-learner is not only the students with me, the co-learner could also, in a constructivist setting, the teacher. Or the co-learning could be people I would like to involve into learning. And then we have the subjective uh, aspect. This has to do, to do with building up my knowledge and building up my competences so that uh, I will develop my own personality. So we have here as well uh, subjective, social, and objective uh, uh, validity, validity claims. Or another, another example. Uh, this presentation media now you're seeing is some kind of uh, objective knowledge. Uh, if you are now giving uh, question and answers in the chat, we would have some, some kind, by the way, it's a, a mistake, a spelling mistake, a com communicative media. And then uh, if you are interacting with me uh, and I give you some task to, to work on, then we would kind of have uh, some kind of subjective media uh, and we have some kind of interactive knowledge. Sorry for using, uh, as I, I took this from a German slide and there was some mistake. I have to uh, improve this slide uh, later on. So let's come now to the end uh, of this complex and uh, very weird uh, sounding uh, quote. Uh, now, I, I think you can understand better what we have said. Education in action is the mapping of semantic relations. Uh, under semantic, we mean uh, the relationship to the world, uh, meaning words, words have some significance. And now we have uh, talked about time. Uh, we know that there are different kinds of time frames, different kinds of settings. And we have also talked about the knowledges and competences. We have different kinds uh, of knowledge uh, uh, and uh, different levels of knowledge. And we have also different never levels of knowledge or uh, cognitive processes. And we have also talked about the three, uh, uh, three um, different types of validity claims. So I think now this uh, sentence is a little bit uh, more understandable. Um, it's important that we have a mapping with time, with knowledge and competences and with the ability to claims. And each learning process, and this includes also the micro-learning process, is uh, under this law, is have to be seen under this law and have to be designed under this law because it's, so it's the, the theory, it's a fundamental theory of education. Uh, what does that mean now in the practice? Um, what we have uh, normally with a technical system, we have an interaction with a learning object. And in some kind, if we have an interaction, think for instance on a learning platform like Moodle, but you could also uh, use some micro-learning systems, for instance, knowledge parts, as we are using uh, in our master course. Uh, then you have some kind of production. A production could be, uh, for instance, answering the multiple choice questions. Yeah? Uh, you use this question, uh, it's a very simple case, of course, uh, and uh, then the system uh, deposits your production and knows what you have done uh, and you have produced an artifact. And the interesting thing now is with the technical system, that this artifact 
uh, we have stored already and we could evaluate it now. We could use this artifact uh, that was, by the way, the objective knowledge side. We, we could use this artifact with an interaction with another human. So we could set it to another human uh, to evaluate it, to comment. For instance, if we had to have a quiz, uh, then the system would uh, try to figure out the other questions and to, and to compare it. Yeah. So we have some kind of uh, reflection. We call it uh, by a term by Donald Schirm, a philosopher and uh, educationalist, um, already um, died. But he had the idea of reflection in action. And if we're doing it many, 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 many times, then we get the timeline uh, of this human being with the knowledge and we have some kind of reflection practice. And the environment, let's say the server infrastructure of the system, um, uh, is uh, taking this, uh, um, observes all these actions uh, and uh, stores it in the database and we can use it for uh, evaluation, for feedback and for a lot of other things, very interesting things in education. And if you're now going with this knowledge to the real world, uh, then we would have uh, a third level and this is kind of a knowledge helix. You could start it again, you have now more knowledge, yeah? you have it on the objective level, you have it on the subjective level, and if you try to put it into practice, you get uh, feedback from the practice, you know if it works or if, if it doesn't work, and then you have it uh, in the uh, interaction with the society. And then you start the helix again uh, on a higher level, uh, but you start it again. So, uh, one of my conclusions is that we would uh, need a theory of defining and structuring the educational dimension of microlearning, or maybe educational dimensions, uh, the plural, of microlearning. And we need some kind of a consistent taxonomy of time frames, educational scenarios for knowledge acquisition. Uh, but what, what we don't need, that one is one of my uh, main uh, hypotheses, we don't need a specialized uh, educational framework for microlearning. That's very important because always people, if they have a new password, then they would like to have a new educational theory. For instance, uh, if it uh, came up with uh, multimedia, then people believed we would need uh, didactics for multimedia. I don't believe that. I think if we choose an appropriate educational theoretical framework, then we should include all the technology and all the different passwords, otherwise it wouldn't be an appropriate educational framework. So now let me come to the end. Uh, I've talked about subject matter and about microcon. But I hope that you now got the idea that these small kinds of chunks of information, these so-called knowledge nuggets, they don't live uh, isolated. They live, they live in an environment, in a hierarchical uh, environment, so we don't have just uh, on the simple issues. And if we see the time frame uh, as a learning time frame, uh, meaning that it could be collected uh, uh, after the, in a, or stretched on a long physical time frame, then it, uh, you can understand that it's not only a very small cognitive process, it's not only a simple task activity. And then uh, the question still arises, and this is one kind of my research focus, could we use microlearning uh, not only in push technology, but pretty much more in the full technology. Does it make sense? Uh, is micro-learning just a starting uh, learning uh, action? Or could we also for use for constructivist uh, uh, environments uh, for self-determined learning? And the third point, very, very important, micro-learning is not only on the cognitive level. It has also some subjective emotional uh, and social issues, uh, and we can think about microlearning also 
as a collaborative uh, effort. So it's not simple issues, it's not simple tasks. Yeah? Uh, the other questions, uh, they are still open. I would try to take a push and pull technology. I would try to have micro learning, not only on the tutored side, but also on the self-determined learning side. And certainly not only uh, for uh, object uh, claims for uh, uh, um, claims with facts, uh, but also with claims with personal and social issues. So that are questions we would like to address in our new master course. So we have uh, actually four kind of competencies we would like uh, to teach you in this master course. Uh, there is the one side that actually not, uh, naturally it's very important that you get some experience for development, implementation uh, and evaluation of this technology. Uh, uh, concerned with uh, knowledge acquisition and competence development in organization. So we need some kind of knowledge in consultancy and coaching. That's important. That's this special aspect on micro learning. If you don't have this kind of consulting and coaching, you can't uh, participate in a micro learning issue. Yeah? It would be uh, a more uh, much more enlarged issue, uh, that you uh, get some experience that also important. It's a technical uh, based uh, master course as well. So there are some modules that you are um, uh, involved in content, produce, con content production uh, and that you get the idea uh, what is uh, micro content produced, what does it mean to produce micro content. Uh, then we have uh, this kind of uh, companies, institution and governmental side. Uh, you remember now we are more on the uh, social side here, on the social validity claims. Uh, and then we have uh, the interaction between small and medium-sized enterprise industries. So we get some kind of uh, potential clients uh, how could we use micro learning in different uh, environments uh, and how could we implement it in different environments and how could we uh, uh, form bridges between small uh, uh, content and uh, short time uh, learning frames to uh, bigger learning frames and uh, complex content. So that's a very important issue. Uh, to combine it. Uh, Microlearning is not a standalone issue. Microlearning is just an aspect of uh, a bigger uh, educational framework. In the curriculum, we will give you some theoretical uh, modules uh, on media and society. There is also a learning theory module. I have uh, in my talk addressed knowledge acquisition and knowledge management and very important organizational planning and development for uh, the uh, producing content and for uh, developing the system. And then the other side, we have education and technology and the design of education and technology design. Uh, you have different kinds of modules and a specialization, naturally enough, uh, on microlearning as well. But you have also some kind of knowledge uh, uh, acquisition in the course about interactive microlearning course we have designed. Uh, by the way, if you don't know what it, does it mean, European Credit Transfer System, that's the abbreviation for ECTS, that means the learning load you have to address in the course. Uh, we have in Austria uh, the calculation that one ECTS is 24, 25 hours of learning uh, uh, effort you have to do, meaning uh, a, a module for, of eight ECTS times 24 means you have 200 hours of learning time, but important learning time, meaning that you, if you have a profession and you are working on an enterprise, uh, you get four months uh, time frame or uh, to put your 200 hours into these four times. 
because we address this microlearning uh, course on a blended learning uh, model. Um, you can contact uh, my colleague uh, in the Vesely, and if you have some technical questions or you would like uh, to inscribe in our course, then please call uh, or get in contact with Christina Kama. Okay, so you have some uh, personal uh, links to my website. I will also write several times on my weblog on microlearning. Uh, and you can also uh, follow me on the Twitter issue. And the most important thing for this talk is the last uh, link. It will give you our website uh, on the Danube University grams, and you will also see there uh, some resources, some materials, a specialized uh, a slideshow uh, produced by Denise Wesley, where you get much more information on our new course, as I have uh, said now in this presentation. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm uh, uh, happy to get your questions. Now.